Good morning, everyone. And good morning to those who are watching on the live stream as well. It's really glad to be here, you know, worshipping together as one uh, BRMC community. I hope that you recall in last month's sermon series, Pastor Gilbert preached an am amazing sermon series on the theology of work. And I hope that you have been reminded that God has called us to our marketplace to serve Him faithfully wherever He has called us. So I hope that we have indeed been living out that call. Today's sermon is really a continuation of that topic. Today we'll be talking about full-time vocational ministry. You know, there are the various kinds such as mission and also parallel church organization. But for today, we're going to be focusing on the pastoral ministry in the church. And when I refer to pastors, I'm going to refer to both pastors and pastoral team staff, which is PTS. And for those of you who may not know, pastors are sent by track. Our PTSs are our local church staff that is employed by the local church, and then they do a specialized ministry within the church. So, for example, you see the handsome Darren over there. He's one of the PTS for our Connect Group ministry. So, it just helps you all to get a better understanding of the various role. You may ask the question, why is this topic important if you are not called to the pastoral ministry? I believe that in the church, we all play a significant role in working together for the sake of the kingdom of God. So it's important that we know our roles, you know, as pastoral staff, as church members, so that we can effectively work together. Just like in a soccer team, you know, we need to know our various role, striker, midfielder, goalkeeper. We need to know our roles so that we can uh, serve effectively. And I know that, you know, sometimes there's this misconception that, you know, pastoral ministry is elevated, you know, uh, above the work in our marketplace. But I hope that you know and understand that we treat the work in the marketplace seriously as well. Those are service towards God as well. And in Pastor Gilbert's sermon series, he has really anchored ourselves in that. So when we talk about today's topic, it's really in that context that everyone is called to serve God in our various fields. And in today, we're going to talk about the church pastoral ministry. So what do you think the pastor does in church? Is he like a CEO? You know, he's supposed to manage the company of the church, making sure that it's very run very effectively. Perhaps, you know, success in church is determined by how satisfied the congregation is, by the attendance, or perhaps maybe by the financial surplus. Decisions are often made based on risk management instead of faith base. As affirmed by Dr. Chang Ming Shun in his recent Methodist message, he talks about this topic. He talks about how you know, the, he affirmed the good work, you know, the good organizational work of the church, and there's so many things that we can learn from secular business practices. But he warned us against adopting it wholesale without considering whether some of them are biblical. Perhaps you may think that the pastor is like a service provider. On Sunday, he preaches the Word of God. He administers the sacraments. He is there on the weekend serving the church. Wherever you need the pastor to do, he is there for you. When you call him to do the wedding, he is there for you. When you ask him to visit your parents, grandparents, he is there for you. Sounds quite pastoral, right? Sounds quite biblical. Well, that is true, I fear that that might actually fit into a consumeristic culture that we may be having in our world today. You know, from grab services to restaurant services, you know, we are always expecting to be served. Whenever, you know, we, we are not served well, we will tend to all oh, complain and then things will get better. However, such an expectation may lead us to think that church is all about what can the church do for me. It leads to a certain expectation of a spiritual consumer rather than spiritual disciples of Christ ministering to one another. So such an approach may lead us to think in that manner. And I hope to clarify here, I'm not saying that the pastors don't minister to the flock. The pastor should continue to minister to the flock, but we must avoid this misconception that the work of ministry doesn't belong to all of us. In fact, all of us have a responsibility to minister to the flock. What then do you think is a pastor? According to Benjamin Merkert, he 
there are at least four roles. The first is the shepherd role, the leader role, the teacher role, and the fourth one is the equipper. In the Bible, the word pastor is translated as shepherd. And then, you know, in our translation today, you heard the word uh, bishop. And then there are other translations that talks overseer, elders, and so on. So while they may be using different terms to, to, to title it, they are actually talking about the same role. And we know that because of the function that is being described of all of these titles. So essentially, they are talking about the same role, and hence, it's talking about the role of the pastor. So the role of shepherd, leader, and teacher are probably quite familiar to all of us. So I'm not going to elaborate too much on that. For today, we're going to talk about the role of an equipper, and I want to really highlight that for us. In our passage for today, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 12, let us read it together, the count of three. One, two, three. He himself granted that some are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So in verse 11, Paul highlights five groups, five gifts of people. And today we're going to talk about the pastors. And as you can see, that their main role here is really to equip the saints for the work of ministry. As affirmed by Howard Hendricks in the quotation shown, is the quotation shown, God is not calling you to do the work of 10 men. He's calling you to equip 10 men to do the work He has called them to do. Hence, their primary role is that of an, an equipper. Most of the time in church, we have this understanding that, you know, the church worker, full-time staff, just do everything. Lah. And then, you know, as a church congregation, my role is just to help you a bit, you know, when I don't have time, then you just do everything else. However, it's actually the reverse. The church, the saints of Christ, all of us, have the responsibility to do the work of ministry. And then pastors, PTSs, you know, their role is that of an equipper, a trainer to train you for the work of ministry. I'm going to use a soccer analogy here to try to ex illustrate and explain this. And I want to caveat here that it's not a perfect analogy. You know, you don't take it holes here. But there are some elements of football that can be applicable here. And some of you may know I'm a football fan. You know, I'm a Manchester United fan. You know, Man, Man U is not doing very well. So, yeah. And then Pastor Ben, you know, he was here in the morning. I was telling we are both uh, Manchester United fans. So I'm going to use the, the soccer analogy to help explain this better. So in a soccer match, right, most, you know, most of the time, you know, we think as church members, we are the audience. We think that we are the audience spectators. You know, clap hand for the, the church workers, the PTS staff on Sunday. Yeah, you know, you know they, they scramble here and there, left and right. Oh, you know, oh, I sweat, sweat a lot. Oh, oh, my. And then we just cheer them. Good job, right? That's what we often think church is like. And then the PTSs are, and the pastors are like the, the soccer players, on the field. However, it's actually the opposite. All of us as church members, as Buckwood, we are, you all are the soccer players. You all are playing the match of loving God and loving one another. And in fact, the audience are the unbelieving world. They are the unbelieving world, the, our colleagues, our friends. They are seeing how we play the match of loving God and loving one another. So this analogy, while not perfect, should reverse our mentality of what we think about ministry. In fact, you know, it is, as the church, we are supposed to do the work of ministry. And then the coach, which is like the pastor PTSs, you know, pastor PTSs, is like, you know, Sir Alex Ferguson, Eric Ten Hag, you know, and then all the very famous coaches. We are like the coach trainer, training you to do the work of ministry. So what are some of these roles, you may ask, in terms of equipping? Firstly, you know, we do equipping by teaching through the sermons, through connect groups, through one-to-one, -one, through causes, the pastors, teachers, the Word of God, through all of that. However, I hope to help us capture another aspect of teaching. The pastor, the role as an equipper, is supposed to teach us to disciple one another. It's supposed to teach us to teach the Word of God to one another. So my vision that I have is really for all of us to be able to teach and read the Word of God with one another, 
to have basic interpretation skills, to have basic Bible skills in order to do so. You don't need the pastor to do that. All of us can have this culture and biblical movement of reading the Bible to one another. Of course, this does not exclude the pastor preaching week in, week out, but all of us have the responsibility to read the Bible to one another on a regular basis. The second aspect is equipping by training. For most of us, when we think about the topic of evangelism, we, all, we always think that you know, evangelism is about inviting uh, people to come to a church event or outreach event, and then that's our role. However, when I think about training, I think about training all of us to be equipped with the skills to know how to share the gospel with one another. Can you imagine with me how amazing it will be that all of us here, 1,000 people over here, are sent out to our marketplaces, they are, you are sent out to our family and friends, knowing how to share the gospel, being able to follow up with conversations, and allowing your friends and family members to see how you live out your faith. That to me is the biblical and most effective way of evangelism. The third way is really equipping by journeying with people. And really, you know, it's about having to set an example, a role model example of what does it mean to believe in Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, it talks about Paul when he writes to Timothy, he says, let no one despise you for your youth, but to set the believer an example. In our passage for today, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the qualification of uh, elders, overseer, there's really a strong emphasis on character. And then in 1 Corinthians, when Paul talks, uh, when Paul writes to the Corinthian church, there's a lot of examples about how Paul asked them to imitate him. So all of this shows that, you know, discipleship is really relational, is personal, and really often things are often caught than taught. The pastors, PTSs have lived out experience or what does it mean to follow Christ? All of us go through our struggles and we all have our own stories of what does it mean to follow God faithfully. So for example, what does it mean to thrive in singlehood? What does it mean to love our spouse? What does it mean to take care of our children? What do we do when suffering inflicts us? All of these are all life stories which our pastors, PTSs, are able to share with you. And I hope that you do give them the opportunity to share with you. As a church, how can we support our pastoral staff? You know, in the word pastoral team, I mean PTS, the word pastoral is already there. And that really should describe the job that they do. When I share this, what I'm trying to also say is that, you know, all of us, you know, I use the analogy of soccer, right? There's a striker, midfielder, goalkeeper, no, you cannot expect the striker to play the role of a goalkeeper. If I was playing the role of the goalkeeper, I'm not saying I'm very good, I'd probably let in all the goals because I'm totally not good at goalkeeping. So likewise, for the PTSs, we should allow them to faithfully do their role. Have we been asking them to do more and more administrative work, more and more program coordination work? I'm not saying that those are not important. As you have heard, my analogy is about being faithfully doing the task that we have been called to do. We are not trying to elevate which one is more important. And I'm not saying that the PTSs shouldn't do all of those roles. But we should allow them to play this primary role of equipping the saints for ministry. Invite them to visit your connect groups. Sometimes, you know, it's a bit hard, but sometimes, you know, like, you know, we may not be that open, but I hope that we can be more open to invite them for CGs. Bring them out for one-to-one -one meals. Hear their life stories. Allow them to speak into your life. And as they equip all of us, it is our responsibility to do the work of ministry. And I want to highlight here for those of us who are not serving, who have not responded to the call to serve, it is also your responsibility as disciples of Christ to serve faithfully for His kingdom. So my first point here is that one of the main role of the pastor is an equipper. And all of us, as disciples of Christ, are called to do the work of ministry. The second point here is, you know, the second question is, how then do we discern our C2 pastoral calling? And I use these slides to highlight what Pastor Gilbert shared last month, you know, C1, C2, C3. We are focusing here on the call to a particular labor, 
for a season. So let me use my story to help you share, share some light. I first heard the call to ministry many, many years ago when I was on a mission trip. And during my, the mission trip, one of the locals asked me if I was considering to become a pastor. And for me, I was quite surprised by that. I didn't know how to respond because actually I had that desire in my heart, but I didn't tell anyone about it. And also, I had this misconception, misunderstanding, you know, that like, we're well, pastors, right? You must have a burning bush experience. Wow, I see God in the burning bush. Oh, I see the angel of the Lord has spoken to me. Yes, our response. So that was my misunderstanding, you know, for, for a calling to a pastor, you must have such a dramatic kind of experience. However, Pastor Anthony Lee, who was my um, ex-mentor, ex-PIC, he journeyed with me and discerned this pastoral calling with me. He affirmed the pastoral heart that I have and the spiritual giftings required for the ministry. And God also spoke to me through 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, which is our passage for today. You know, if really anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. So the word expires, desire, really show that it's important. Desire is the starting point. And oftentimes you may think that you know, desire is a bad thing. So, but do not dismiss this desire as selfish ambition. God perhaps is using that desire to speak to you. Perhaps it is indeed what God wants you to do. But desire alone is not enough. You need other layers of confirmation. You need the confirmation of testing out this calling. So for me, you know, I, I went to do a three-month internship with my home church. So I went to the marketplace for a while, and then I went to, to in my experience, uh, in the marketplace, the desire in my heart for equipping saints for the work of ministry grew. So I enjoyed the work in the marketplace. I really believe it's an outreach field. But yet at the same time, I also sense this growing desire to do the work of ministry. Hence, I decided to respond to do a three months internship. And then through the three months internship, I responded to serve as a pastoral staff in my church. Aside from the desires that God has placed in my heart, the church community also affirmed the future giftings that I have for the pastoral ministry. You know, responding to the call to ministry is not about pursuing one's dream. It's not about self-fulfillment. But the key here is stewardship. It is about stewarding the gifts that God has given you for the ministry. So while I'm thankful for the church affirmation, I'm reminded not to let pride grow in me and to focus on the goodness of God. What are some biblical principles you have glimpsed from my story? As I have shared, you know, First Timothy 3 verse 1, the starting point is desire. And then as confirmed by the next slide in the quotation, it says that God provides and one more. God provides objective, observable, observable qualification to test the subjective desire of all who seek the office of overseer. Desire alone is not enough. It must be matched by good character and future capability. So the second prince, the next principle, the first principle is do you have a desire? The second principle is do you have godly character? And look at the long list of character qualification in 1 Timothy 3, which is our passage today. It talks about a lot of character traits. So God really prioritizes character over skills. God is looking for people of God with good character. He's not looking for the perfect, not saying that perfect character, but these character traits must be present. We also, we also, he's also not looking for potential good character. Maybe the person doesn't have good character, but you are hoping that he will grow to good character. No, we're not looking for potential good character. If the person you are appointing and seeing is now, that person must presently have good character. The third principle here is, am I gifted? And we look to the external call to help us. You know, Pastor Gilbert's sermon talked about internal, external. You know, we need to look to the external call to help us. Do others affirm your spiritual giftings for the pastoral ministry? Can you preach and teach? Can you shepherd? Do the people under your ministry see spiritual growth? What do others think your spiritual gifts are? 
Your community is the best gauge for what spiritual gifts you have. Because spiritual gifts is for the benefit of others and they will have first experience of it. So using my soccer analogy, how will you know that you are a good striker, right? How do you know? You cannot, like, let's say I proclaim, I am a, Joshua is a good striker, but then I cannot score goals. Like, I let I let all the chance on miss one, wow, the, I kick the ball every time, fly everywhere, but then no score or goal. Then obviously, I don't have the gift of being a good striker. So similarly, a spiritual gift as well, in order to know whether you have the spiritual gift, is to see, ask your community whether they have seen firsthand of it. So you may ask, you know, I don't have the pastoral calling, you may think, but what can you do as a church to help people affirm their pastoral calling? In your connect group, do you have opportunities to share about your spiritual gifts? Do you have opportunities, not just only about pastoring, but also sharing your other spiritual gifts in your connect group? And if you know someone who has the gift of shepherding and teaching, perhaps, why not highlight it to him? Let him know that he has that gift. Affirming someone's spiritual gift does not automatically mean that he or she becomes a pastor. So don't be afraid. You know? don't, go as, don't be scared. You, know? you don't dare tell this person because later you say that he, he thinks he is a pastor. As you have seen in today's sermon, there are many layers of confirmation. So it is really up to him and God to really discern that. But for our responsibility is to encourage and affirm those who have those spiritual giftings. So point two for today, how do you discern if you have a pastoral calling? Do you desire pastoral work? Do you have godly character? Does your community affirm your pastoral calling? Do they affirm the spiritual giftings for the role? So as we think about pastoral calling, perhaps you may be also thinking, what are some challenges that one may face when entering it? So I'm also going to use my story to also illustrate my points as well. So before, you know, I shared my story about going for a three months internship and then serving my church as a PTM. Before responding in obedience, I really struggle with a lot of financial consideration. In my mind, you know, a lot of my peers upon graduation, you know, after working for a few years, were doing very well in their careers. Then in my mind, okay, I'm very prideful at that time while I was like saying, God, I'm also very capable, right? You know, I want to do so well, you know, that kind of thing, right? Then I should also be earning as much as them. So that was my pride speaking to me. But God spoke to me through these following verses uh, from 1 Timothy. So let us read it together. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 19 together. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasures of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. So firstly, I learned to set my hope on God and not on riches. To know that God will provide for everything that I need to enjoy. Secondly, is to be rich in good works and not in money. To be rich in good works and to respond to serve Him wherever He has called me. So when, I, when God showed me this verse, I repented and I told God, Yes, Lord, I will trust you wherever you lead me to. I will follow you wherever you ask me to go. There are also some practical considerations, and I want to assure you that God will indeed provide you for your needs. Of course, not a luxurious need, but provide you for whatever you need in order to fulfill His will. Secondly, the second thing that I also hold closely to is really to live simply, to live within one's means. Our founder, John Wesley, also have that principle as well. And I believe my, most of all my colleagues also leave that out as well. The pay is also sufficient uh, for basic livinghood in Singapore. I'm not saying that, wow, you're super rich, that kind of thing, but for basic livinghood, it is sufficient for us. Perhaps, you know, you may struggle with some doubts and inadequacy to fulfill that role. And I want to say that it is indeed, the pastoral calling is indeed a weighty role and one should not take it 
too easily. However, I want to share with you that you're not alone in feeling that way in terms of doubts and inadequacy. If you look at the Bible, the Bible has numerous examples of saints who struggle with God, who struggle with doubts, and yet God was with them and God equipped them for the work. For example, Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. Joshua led the Israelites into the promised land. They also struggle as they respond to God, yet God equipped them all. Similarly, if you have the call to pass down ministry or whatever roles that God is calling you to do, God is going to equip you for the work. You only need to respond in obedience and to depend on Him. What challenges are you facing in responding to God's call? Perhaps it's pride in our heart, thinking you know, that you know, I don't want to let go of my career success. Is it financial considerations? Is it doubts or inadequacy? And I want to say that all these struggles are real and genuine. And our first response is to pray and seek the Lord. Secondly, is to find out about pastoral calling. What is it all about? To seek counsel from other people, especially from people who know you well. Sign up for the Courage and Calling course that Pastor Gilbert is conducting. And I believe the first session starts, to, starts today's afternoon. Talk to one of our pastors or PTSs about what this work entails. And if you are sensing that God is calling you, you are not actually quite sure, sign up for our internship. You know, to, in today's context, there are many terms used to describe it. Internship, training, apprenticeship, you know. Right? I think there are various terms to describe this. And Buckroot has an internship program. It is an opportunity for you to discern and test if God is indeed calling you to the ministry. You know, in the marketplace, we often pursue various internships. You know, we try to uh, discern what career God is leading us and perhaps also to gain more and more marketplace experience. And this is a trend that I see in today's context, you know, more and more people sign up for a lot of various internships. But however, why have we not considered church internship as one of the area? Why do we straight away assume that we are not called to the ministry? Another question that one may have is, should you have some marketplace experience uh, before uh, going to the ministry? I want to say that there are various um, different examples some people, upon graduation, went to TDC and served in pastoral ministry. Some people went outside to work for a few years before going into ministry. And I want to say that there's really no formula for this. There's no so-called right or wrong answer in that way. The right answer is that you obey God's timing. God sets the timing, not human wisdom. God is the one who sets the timing, and then you just obey accordingly. In Bakarut, there are various opportunities to serve as a pastoral team staff, and they are listed on the slides. And I want to say that you should only apply if God is calling you to serve and you meet the relevant qualifications that I have been describing. And if you're not pretty sure, you're not very sure, talk to us first. We will be able to guide you and discern with you. And I want to clarify, just because you have been worshipping here for many years, does not mean that, oh, I'm called to the pastoral ministry. So when you apply for it, it's still important for us to discern together with you if you have a pastoral calling. So just because you apply doesn't automatically mean, oh, you know, you will get the role. While there are challenges in ministry, there are also much joy as well. Oftentimes, when we think about ministry, you know, the narrative that you may, you may be hearing tends to be negative. Ah, yeah, wow, not enough staff, la. Ayah. Ayo, not enough pastors, oh no, oh no, we're going through a crisis. And I want to say that all these challenges are true, I'm not saying that they are not true, but I want to tell you that there's also a lot of joy in pastoring God's church. For myself, and I, and I believe for most of my colleagues, you know, we do not see ministry as a sacrifice, you know, wow, very sien, as a sacrifice, but we see ministry as a joy and privilege, it is a privilege to serve Him in His work. I enjoy discipling others and enjoy journeying with people to see how God transformed their life. 
I enjoy preaching, as you hopefully you may tell, and to see how the Word of God speak to the people that listen. I really enjoy the work of ministry and I'm thankful for the privilege to do so. You may be thinking, you know, how does it apply to me for those who are not serving in the pastoral ministry? How can we support our pastoral staff? As a church, let us be pray, praying for them. Let us affirm our pastoral staff for the good work they are, that they have been doing. Let us also be specific in what we are encouraging them or affirming them for. So now I'm going to take this opportunity. I kind of didn't really tell them. Yeah, so I'm going to take this opportunity. Maybe some of you no, don't even know who our pastoral staff are. right? I mean, I don't assume that we all know. So I'm going to take this opportunity to get them to stand up wherever they are so that you may know who they are. And as they stand up, let us encourage them. So may I ask the PTSs to stand up wherever you are? The, the, they are right at the back also. Maybe take a look at who they are over here at the back and also over here. I think some of them are upstairs also. I cannot uh, uh, see them. So let's affirm them for the hard work. Y'all may be seated. Yeah, I don't want to make them come in front. Actually, I was thinking about it. You know, let, let's let them come in front. Then, but you know, a bit pious here, so I, I, I totally understand. Not so chan uh, okay? So the homework that I have for you right now that you have recognized their face is to go and encourage them. Okay, I want to um, give you a homework. After, I know after I talk so much, right, then sometimes we may not really follow up with it. So I want to challenge you. After the service, go and encourage at least one pastor or staff, one PTS. Tell them what are the good work that they've been doing. Help them feel appreciated, appreciated and affirmed. And I want to say that, you know, that I appreciate some of us who have been you know, encouraging and affirming our pastor or staff. Thank you for encouraging us for the good work that we have been doing. But this culture of affirmation does not just belong to a few. It belongs to all of us. All of us have a part to play in encouraging and affirming our staff. And not just affirming our staff, but also affirming one another in our church community. So let that be our culture in Bakurut Methodist Church. So my third point here is that to turn to God when facing obstacle in answering his call to the pastoral ministry. And remember that there are indeed much joy in shepherding others. So in conclusion, we learn that the pastor is not like a CEO or you know, a service provider. One of the main role of the pastor is an equipper. And all of us need to be equipped to do the work of ministry. My second point, I also explore what does it mean to discern if you have the pastoral calling, firstly, I talk about how, you know, do you desire the pastoral work? Do you have godly character? Do your community affirm your pastoral calling? Do they affirm your spiritual gifts for the role? My last point was that, you know, in, in answering this call, there will be obstacles, there will be challenges. But the assurance here is that we can turn to God and God is with us as we respond to Him. And there is indeed much joy in shepherding others. How does today's sermon apply to us? Perhaps you may, may feel that, you know, I'm not really called to the pastoral ministry. How does this apply to us? While not everyone is called to pastoral ministry, each of us are called to minister to one another. All of us are called a commission to our marketplaces, to our various mission field to live out His calling. So all of us have a role to play. From today's sermon, I hope that you will know and respond by empowering our pastoral staff to equip us for the work of ministry. Let us take the time to affirm them for the good work that they are doing. As a church, let us pray for good pastors to be raised and to identify them and to nurture this potential pastor. It is our role as a church community to nurture the next generation of pastors. And if he's indeed calling you to the pastoral ministry, would you respond? If you know of your children or your grandchildren who have the call to ministry, would you release them? Would you 
pray for them? Will you cheer them on and encourage them for this important work? Let us pray. In Pastor Gilbert's sermon, he commissioned us into the marketplace. Today, I want to make a call to pastoral ministry. And I want to emphasize here that this call is not driven by recruitment strategies or manpower issue. It is a matter of discipleship. It is a matter of obedience. And I am concerned that some of us have heard the call but have not responded in obedience. God has indeed been speaking to our hearts, calling some of us for this work. And our excuse cannot be, oh, ask someone else instead. Our excuse cannot be, or oh, uh, let me just contribute financially. If God is calling you, you need to respond in obedience. So take the time now to pray. And soon, we're going to sing the response song. And after, a, after the response song, I'm going to lead you all to respond. For some of you all who have called to the pastor, which I'm going to encourage you, I'm going to challenge you later on to raise your hands if God is indeed calling you. But for now, we're going to, um, the worship team will help lead us in a response song. And as they lead, take the time to pray and I'll give you the opportunity to respond accordingly. Oh 
Jesus, you are leading us to deeper waters. Help us to respond to you in obedience. You are our great God. You are our King. You are the Lord of our lives. You have been so good to us. Help us, Lord, to know your goodness. Help us, Lord, to know that in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of the challenges that we may be experiencing, to be assured that you are with us in the fire. You are with us. So help us to respond in obedience today. And with all eyes closed, if God is leading you to the pastoral ministry, I'm not going to ask you all to come forward. I'm just going to ask you all to raise your hands wherever you may be. And raising your hands doesn't mean that you automatically become a pastoral staff next day or a pastor next day. But we really want to journey with you and descend together with you. So if that is you, you can raise your hands and then you can come and find us after the service. We are not going to pressure you or anything like that, but we just want to give you that opportunity to respond and descend together. So if all eyes closed, if there is you, you can raise your hand so that I can know who you are. Only the pastors will know who you are and then we will just journey with you on this call to the pastor of ministry. So just give you a while. Dear Jesus, we thank you for all our pastoral stuff. We thank you, Lord, that you are the one leading and guiding all of us. For some of us who have the call, may you help them receive the courage and affirmation of their community. And as a church, let us continue to pray for our pastors and PTSs May we continue to affirm the good work they are doing. And may you as a church help us create a culture of encouragement and affirmation. Let us be a church that nurtures and raises up the next generations of pastors as well. Let this be our call. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.